So I'm going to run you through um, the basics of emerging markets and how you can go about investing in them. Now, there's going to be a couple of slides which talk about past performance. So I think it's really important to understand that um, past performance is not a guide to the future performance and some investments do need to be held for the long term. And I'm also going to be discussing some stocks and funds within my presentation. And just to reiterate, this is none of this is a recommendation for you. So I'm going to go through the definition of emerging markets, why it's done well recently, um, preconceptions versus reality. Then we'll talk about the benefits of having some exposure in your portfolio and the risks to consider. And then I'll finish up with some ways to invest. So emerging markets have been quite topical in the last year, particularly as investors got over the initial shock of the pandemic and started to look further forward into the future. There was a realization that we could potentially see rapid economic growth as countries pick themselves up and get back on their feet again. So within that, emerging markets have been highlighted by a number of investment professionals as being potentially a beneficiary of what was going to go on. So over the last 12 months to the end of March, the All Country World Index, which you could see is a benchmark for global stock markets, that's up by 50% in the last year, but Emerging Markets Index is up by 55%. So we've already seen some outperformance in the last year. Now on the screen, you can see the data for the last 20 years. So the All Country World Index is up by 260%, but actually the MSCI Emerging Markets Index is up by more than twice this amount at 695%. I think it's very important to understand that emerging markets are not always in favor. If you look at the last 10 years to the end of March 2021, the All Country World Index was up 168%, but the Emerging Markets Index was only up by 96%. So I think it's very important for you to understand what could go wrong as well as what could go right. And I'll, I'll come on to some of those points in a minute. The International Monetary Fund has a list of countries that fit under the definition of emerging markets. And these include Brazil, India, Indonesia, China, Pakistan, Mexico, Russia, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates. And the one thing about the majority of these countries is that they have shown an ability to, to display quite strong economic growth. And this is what's attracting people to this space of the investment universe. So in the last year, emerging markets have actually really benefited from weakness in the US dollar. So as the uh, coronavirus took shape um, and then the world sort of looked to different governments to see how are you going to cope with this? How are you going to help rebuild your economies? Well, in the US, with the the, uh, the, the appointment of Joe Biden as the, as the president of the United States, he is seen as someone who wants to spend heavily, particularly on infrastructure um, and other things to try and help rebuild the economy. And of course, the associated uh, downside of that is that the U.S. debt is go is ballooning. So this this is weakening the U.S. dollar. And historically, when we have a weak U.S. dollar, we have a good tend to have a good performance with emerging markets. And of course, when the dollar strengthens, the opposite is true of what happens with emerging markets. So now, as economies are picking themselves up again, one might expect inflation to pick up. And that's certainly the case at the moment. So, and then with inflation would naturally, the conversation would turn to rising interest rates. So cyclical stocks are very much in fashion at the moment and emerging markets is full of cyclical stuff. So I'm thinking here like financials and miners. So when you have accelerating inflation, you tend to see rising commodity prices. Now, emerging markets are very important exporters of commodities. Uh, and so that might explain why this whole space is very much in demand at the moment. 
when people talk about emerging markets, they quite often say, well, isn't this a place that's got, you know, it, it's high risk. Share prices go up and down in, in, in sort of big wild movements. And to illustrate that point, I've run a chart that shows various indices for different countries. So the black line you can see on your screen is the MSCI India. So this represents uh, generally the benchmark for the Indian stock market. The green line is the China stock market, and the purple line is the UK, which is the FTSE 100. So you can see that China and India have been up and down, up and down. But actually, if you'd held them for those 20 years, the returns would have been very good. So just, you know, I'm not sure if you can see some of the numbers on your screen, but India is up 912% over those 20 years. China's up 830. Those are considerably greater returns than you'd seen in the FTSE 100, um, which was just under 150%. But it's really important here is if you're not comfortable with investments falling in value and you get worried, I'm not so sure that emerging markets is necessarily for you. Because as the screen shows, there will be periods if you're holding India, for example, where you've gone through some really, really big um, falls in those markets. If we look at the 10 year data now, the gap between India and the UK has narrowed considerably. So India was up 80, roughly about 84 percent over 10 years, 67 percent for the FTSE 100. But it's China who stands out yet again, more than double the UK performance here over 10 years. Now, and it boils down to emerging markets are really, if you want growth, this is one of the key places that you've been able to find it. So on your screen, you can see some economic projections by the IMF. Everything in yellow is relates to emerging markets. And this is also um, the figures that are greater than the world output. So if we look to 2022, you can see here, this is the, the IMF thinks that the world is going to grow by 4.2% in 2022. The emerging market is going to grow by 5% in this year, and, and China in particular grow by 5.6%, and India by 6.8%. So you can see here that there's some very interesting growth figures concentrated on emerging markets. Although I must note, you know, the UK is still expected to grow by 5%, which is quite impressive. So the rise of the middle class has been one of the most significant social and demographic trends we've seen in the 21st century. And this is an, this is an important driver for emerging markets. You know, the parts of the world are getting wealthier and the number of middle class consumers projected to rise dramatically over the next 15 years or so, and particularly in Asia. Now, the UK stock market has lagged quite a lot other markets in the world in the last decade or so. And, and that's made people look overseas a bit more for their investment exposure. So a diversified investment portfolio will have different asset classes. It will have different sectors. And actually, it should have different geographies as well. Um, when people talk about emerging markets, they tend to associate it with China. But I think that it's really important to, to look at all the different countries you've got there. Um, and I'm just going to give you three examples now of non-China ones and, and why they might be quite interesting. With Mexico, there's a desire by um, US companies to reduce their reliance on manufacturing in Asia. So we've seen for years companies set up shop in Asia to benefit from cheap labor. But, but now what they want is US companies want um, someone very close to them who can supply them so they don't have to hold lots of inventory. So Mexico is a natural candidate to benefit from this. And it's also it's not got the concerns around intellectual property theft that you might associate with some places in emerging markets as well. So, you know, particularly China, I think lots of Western companies are a bit concerned that China might steal their ideas. But uh, Mexico at the moment doesn't have that um, that situation. So with Taiwan, there's a very educated workforce there, and, th and it's developed this brilliant reputation as an exporter of key technical, technological components. And as for Russia, I think just think lots of people think it's just to do with oil and gas, but actually the, the, you know, the country is in um, 
and quite a good sort of shape from a balance sheet perspective um, that you can get some quite high dividend yields there. And it's got consumer and tech sectors are becoming very, very important. Politics is still an issue, but I think that's probably represented by some discounted equity valuations there. So those are some of the drivers. And I think now we should look at the, the risks. So PricewaterhouseCoopers says that trying to analyze corporate governance in emerging markets is tough. And um, you, know, you can see why there's a different regulatory standards. The disclosure requirements are different, different in local investor preferences. Yes, there's some progress being made trying to improve corporate governance, but we've got corruption, we've got bureaucracy. I mean, there's just a general lack of transparency. So these are sort of issues that you must consider if you think about putting money into this part of the, the, um, the investment universe. Currencies can be very volatile um, and politics a big issue. You know, lots of governments in emerging markets aren't particularly trustworthy. Um, you've got you know situations where they don't want to follow the rules they they won't honor contracts and, and they might even seize assets um and i think that there's perhaps an understated risk is the ability for emerging markets to sustain strong levels of growth and i i read this really interesting article the other day in the financial times written by an artemis fund manager called simon edelston and he said that Investing in China, no, or just ch China in general, has been a, a fantastic story within emerging markets for the last 30 years. It's become the factory of the world. And we've seen you know, companies take advantage of cheap labor. And we've had double digit economic growth there. We've got a, a, a healthier um, workforce and you know, just there's been some real positive ways. But you know, is this coming to an end? The, there's an aging population that needs caring for. There's a, there's a smaller cohort of workers going into the workforce. When you have double digit economic growth, it's really hard you know, under the law of big numbers to keep growing at that such a rate, particularly when you're coming from a high base and not a low one. And of course, when you've got economic growth, it's only natural that wages will go up. So will China lose its competitive advantage with cheap labor costs? So these are definitely things to think about when you're uh, looking at China from an investment perspective. So how about ways to invest in the emerging markets? Well, three spring to mind when I look at this space. One would be buying a tracker fund or an exchange traded fund that, that is mirroring the performance of a basket of shares. So an emerging market index would contain a basket of shares that follow specific rules. So in this case, it'd be relevant to emerging markets. If that index went up by 5%, then hopefully your ETF would do exactly the same. You could buy an actively managed fund with investments in emerging markets or just buy individual company shares relevant to the space. I'll go through each one of those now. So most of the London stock market listed emerging markets related ETFs track the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. Now, this is an index of nearly 1400 companies, covers 27 countries. And every quarter, the MSCI index provider will do a review and, and refresh that index. So uh, I'll give you an example of a product that is tracking the index is the Lixor MSCI Emerging Markets ETF, and the ticker is LEML. That's just one of many that you could choose from. Now, if you look at the, some of the performance stats on the screen now, again, anything in yellow is, is better than the, the comparative one. So you can see that MSCI Emerging Markets is, when it's doing well, uh, the figures can be brilliant. So you know, look at 2017, it's 37%. Uh, in 2012, it's, it's returned 18%. But importantly, look at those bad years. Essentially, when things go bad with emerging markets, you really can suffer in terms of from an investment perspective. Look at 2011, for example, the all country world index fell by just over 7%, but the emerging market index fell by 18%. So just to reiterate, if you're uncomfortable holding investments when things are going wrong and you don't like to see your, your money being eroded, then think 
carefully about this space because this is a high risk part of the market. The MSCI Emerging Markets Index contains, let's say, nearly 1,400 companies, the biggest of which is Taiwan Semiconductor, and that, that counts for about 6.6% 6 .6 of the index. You've got quite a few Chinese companies in there, like Tencent and, and Alibaba. Um, you've got the South African internet media company, Naspers, the Indian industrial conglomerate, Reliance. Um, and there's also there's the China Construction Bank in there as well. So you can see that China, Taiwan, South Korea make up quite a big chunk of that index. And of course, this leads some people to say, is it too concentrated? I mean, essentially, uh, you know, I I wanted diversified exposure, but you're now telling me that if I track this index, it's massive chunk towards China. But actually, lots of other people say, well, is it too broad because it's tracking 27 different countries? So I'll leave that one to you to have a think about. But it's it's you know if you're particularly looking for something just on China then perhaps you might want to look at a China specific fund because there's lots available. You don't necessarily just have to go with an emerging markets one. So active funds. So this is where you'd pay a small fee to a fund manager every year and they do all the hard work managing the portfolio. And I think a lot of people like this because they, they may not necessarily know the companies in emerging markets. They're not really household names to people in the UK. Um, and hopefully that the fund managers job here is to beat the market whereas if you had an exchange traded fund an etf that's only going to track the market so looking at the the, the top 50 purchase funds and investment trusts on you invest website in the in a week to first of april 2021 some of the relevant ones to emerging markets include bailey gifford china fidelity asia and utilico emerging markets and Emily and Mateus who are going to be giving presentations in a second they they both represent actively managed funds and then finally we've got uh, individual companies so on the London stock market there's a few companies which do lots of business in emerging markets and these include the car seller Inchcape the asset manager Ashmore and the consumer goods company Reckitt so Hopefully that's given you um, a good basis in which to, to sort of start understanding this space.